Perfect. Um, so Josh wanted me to introduce myself briefly. Um, I just received my PhD from UW-Madison and I also trained there in the Center for Demography and Ecology and the Center for Demography of Health and Aging as well, uh, where I was a pre-doctoral trainee. Uh, so I've, I've taken courses in uh, formal demographic methods, but um, it's really excited, exciting to be in a department that uh, does that as just the baseline of everything y'all do. Um, but yeah, so I've, I've had a great time so far uh, getting uh, to know people and I'm looking forward to, to meeting more people as well. Um, I'm gonna structure this talk into two parts. I'm first gonna give an overview of my broader research agenda, and then I'm gonna go dive into one very specific, specific research question. So let me share my screen. Can y'all see that? Looks great. Great. All right, so my work is primarily guided by the question, how do ecological con contexts influence social and demographic processes? And one ecological context that I'm particularly interested in is the ever-changing landscape of labor markets and job opportunities that exist within them. Uh, starting in the 1980s, U.S. labor markets began shedding millions in middle-skill, middle-class jobs from the manufacturing sector. And there's nothing inherently great about manufacturing jobs, but the issue is that as these well-paying jobs have disappeared, they haven't been replaced by comparable opportunities in the service sector. And that's really the concern about the loss of manufacturing jobs. I should note that when I refer to manufacturing, I'm referring to businesses that produce goods, such as cars, clothes, industrial machinery and so on. Um, workers in this industry are primarily production workers actually themselves building or operating the machinery that produces goods, but it also includes workers um, in other occupations as well. Um, so this is a, a graph of uh, the absolute number of jobs, uh, but in relative terms, in 1980, there are about one in every four American workers was employed in manufacturing. Um, and now in 2020, uh, pre and post COVID, um, we're at about one in every 10 workers today. So in prior work, I've investigated how this restructuring of the US labor market has impacted population trends. Uh, in a paper published in Demography in 2019, I examined the association between uh, the closure of goods producing businesses and declining fertility rates. And the findings of this study showed that uh, in the years following the Great Recession, structural changes to the labor market were a better predictor of declining U.S. fertility rates than conventional indicators, such as uh, the unemployment rate. Um, in another study, I find evidence that the loss of manufacturing jobs strongly predicts the rise of the ongoing drug and overdose epidemic um, that's taken uh, over 700,000 lives over the past two decades. Um, the results that I uh, estimate in this paper are, they persist even uh, when uh, adjusting for state level policies that reduce the supply of prescription opioids. Uh, in, an, in other co-authored work, I've also explored how structural racism within labor markets produces population health disparities, uh, including racial mortality gaps. And additionally, I've extended this line of research to include racial mortality, uh, sorry, I've extended this research uh, to include labor market outcomes. Um, with Elizabeth Wrigley Field, we've, we're currently working on a project right now looking at what explains uh, black-white disparities in job layoffs, and we're pretty much finding that it's uh, within occupation or within industry discrimination rather than differences across industries or across occupations. Now, similar to factory closures and deindustrialization, climate disasters can similarly impact uh, social and demographic processes, either through the rapid impact of a natural disaster on a population or through the decades long gradual process of climate change and how that alters the environments in which humans live. Uh, in prior work, I've investigated how Hurricane Katrina in 2005 altered the racial population composition of New Orleans. With Jenna Nobles, we found that fertility rates in New Orleans decreased for black women and increased for white women in the years following the storm. 
And we found that this analysis, in this analysis, um, we found these results uh, persisted even when we accounted for trends in net migration of uh, migration driven population changes. Uh, Nathan, could you just use your mouse to show, show us what you just said with the, the effect of, yeah. Sure, so this is the, uh, the pre Katrina period and this is the post Katrina period. And um, this blue line is um, the TFR, total fertility rate for white women. Um, and the green line is the total fertility rate for black women. And we see that after Katrina in 2005, which we, we leave out here um, because of data uh, reporting issues in 2005. Um, fertility rates spiked um, for white women. Um, there was a brief spike for black women as well, but um, it, it went down in blue. Uh, and we use a, a difference in difference uh, analysis there to, to find that effect. Thanks, perfect. Sure. Um, so my ongoing research in this area um, seeks to develop computational methods to identify the migration patterns of displaced populations, particularly those displaced by natural disasters. And um, so that's my broader research agenda, and I'm looking forward to continue connecting with folks here at Berkeley who are interested in these topics. Um, so looking forward to chatting with people. Do you want to so, say about that, a word about what you, what you just showed on the previous slide? Sure, of course, yeah. So, uh, with Jenna Nobles, we've created a method to um, looking at deviations in, um, in birth weight and other birth characteristics to identify where displaced populations uh, have moved. Um, and we, we generalize this method um, that can be used with any sort of administrative data set in which uh, some sort of treatment occurs to one area, one unit of that uh, uh, at, at a certain time period. Um, so Hurricane ha Katrina happens, uh, everyone moves out of New Orleans, at least for a short period of time. Um, and those births and the characteristics of that population are dispersed elsewhere to different states, to different counties within Louisiana. And we've essentially developed a method to attempt to pick up uh, where the change in the characteristics from the sending area, uh, where the receiving area is. So identifying where, uh, where people have moved. Great, and, thank you. And this, sure, and this is something that's generalizable, not just working with uh, natality records, but could be used with other sorts of administrative data as well. Uh, and one more thing, uh, here we, we use an actual data set to, um, to test it out with Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Maria, um, but we also, uh, we use computational simulations to get a sense of what the, the bounds are for picking up certain effect sizes um, and, and that sort of stuff. Great, so, but today I'm gonna present some of my ongoing research uh, examining how birth cohorts experience the world very differently based on where, where they live and when they were born. I'll be focusing, uh, one moment. yeah, so in this paper, I study how the ongoing transformation of US labor markets has increased economic insecurity and has created new sources of social stratification. I focus on intergenerational income mobility here because it represents a central outcome of labor market inequalities. Uh, for those who aren't too well versed, intergenerational mobility refers to the likelihood that a child will attain a status that's different from their parents. Uh, sociologists and social scientists were interested in this concept because it characterizes the extent to which societies change over time and the extent to which uh, people can move up or move down. Uh, and so recent findings in the social sciences have demonstrated that although intergenerational income mobility has been fairly flat and stable uh, for most of the second part of the 20th century, there's substantial geographic heterogeneity. Uh, we see that upward mobility is not spread evenly across communities in the United States. Um, for birth cohorts born in the 1980s, 
uh, surpassing the income attainment of one's parents is less likely to happen if you're born in the Southeast, here in the red, uh, than in the Midwest a little bit as well, uh, than if you were born elsewhere. So the lighter colors here represent areas where there is more upward mobility. And I'll get into measurement uh, in a little bit. So a critical unresolved question in the social stratification literature is what accounts for the spatial variation? Why does being raised in New York increase your odds of earning more than your parents than if you were raised in Florida? So what I'm gonna argue here is that the job destruction in the manufacturing sector and the decline of middle-class job opportunities as a result of that have contributed to reductions in upward income mobility. And they help explain this geographic variation that we see. So just to quickly jump into the data and begin, I'm gonna, I'm presenting right now a map of uh, manufacturing decline. So here's the geography of manufacturing decline over the last four decades. Um, and what I've plotted is the percentage point decrease in manufacturing employment over this time period, where the yellow represents, the yellow side of the gradient represents uh, a larger decrease in manufacturing employment. Um, and something really important to point out here is that even just a 10 percentage point decrease in manufacturing employment is a fairly big drop. So it's kind of, uh, you know, when you see this for the first time, just seeing the extent to which manufacturing jobs have decreased, um, where, you know, a quarter uh, of jobs in a county have disappeared that were previously in manufacturing, you can just kind of see the extent here. Um, and one interesting descriptive finding as well is that we see that um, some of the hardest hit areas here, such as uh, the Southeast, the Great Lakes area of the Midwest, um, the Pacific Northwest as well, um, these are also areas that experience low levels of upward mobility, as I just showed previously in the previous slide. And I'll just kind of flick back um, for a second um, just to see that correspondence. Um, and I'll flick forward. Um, so, so not entirely, but there is some sort of alignment. Um, and an important thing to note is that these are commuting zones while this graph I made, this map I made are counties. So there's three research questions that I seek to answer in this, uh, in this paper. I'm gonna just really focus on the two, the first two in this presentation. Um, first, are geographic differences in income mobility explained by variation in levels of manufacturing? Um, and second, uh, do community-specific histories of industrial change explain differences in income mobility? And then finally, how do successive birth cohorts born within communities differentially, exp differentially experience labor market change? So uh, say someone uh, grows up in Berkeley, California, and then three years later, they have a sibling who then also grows up in Berkeley, California. How does uh, both of these siblings being raised in the same place, but at different time periods, how, how does that give them different opportunities um, for occupational advancement and then ultimately uh, economic attainment? I'm gonna answer these questions using a linked data set that in combines uh, business register data on employment uh, spatial and contextual economic attributes, and then intergenerational mobility data. And this data set consists of nine separate birth cohorts born between 1980 to 1988, uh, who are nested within counties. And uh, to go back to the example that I just gave about those two siblings, um, the, the unique panel design here, it allows me to examine how places produce people over time and how uh, the outcomes of birth cohorts can vary according to annual changes in local labor market conditions. So just to clarify the measures, I'm, I use a measure of absolute mobility that gauges how, uh, how many income percentiles a child born at the bottom of the distribution, uh, at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution can expect to reach in adulthood. 
Um, and this is measured at ages um, 24 and age 26 for the child becoming an adult. Um, and you might think that the mid-20s are way too early to measure economic attainment of children, um, but there's fairly good evidence showing that within the first 10 years of one's career, um, early in the 20s, that's highly predictive of later life time earnings. Now, of course, these studies have been done on cohorts that have already uh, reached their, their, the entirety of their career, or at least uh, fairly far into their career. So we don't know how uh, present day Gen Xers and, and millennials, whether or not the same trends will hold for them, but it's the best sort of um, evidence that we have so far. Um, but in addition to that, I also use some data that, uh, that looks at income mobility measured at age 30 and 31 to 37. The issue with these, uh, these measures, however, is that they're for pooled co cohorts and not for nine separate growth cohorts. All right, and the manufacturing measure is the percent of workers employed in manufacturing versus all of their industries. So this is a relative measure. And in this paper, I additionally do some robustness checks where I test um, other measures, the percent of earnings that are concentrated in manufacturing and an absolute measure of factory and plant closures as well. So just to briefly illustrate how this panel design works, I'm gonna use Kenosha County, Wisconsin as, as an example of how I parameterize my models. Uh, this graph shows uh, the share of workers in manufacturing Kenosha between 1974 to 2016. We can see that manufacturing steadily decreased over this time. About half of all workers were in manufacturing in Kenosha in 1970s. Uh, but in 2016, this had reached only about 10%. And we can see that there was a steep decline in 1988, which is corresponds to when a Chrysler auto plant closed down. So when we think about how cohorts experience the world differently based on their historical time in which they were born, Kenosha County is a very good example of how cohorts from the same place can have very different experiences and how those different experiences can impact their job prospects. So for the 1980 birth cohort, they were born into a context in which half of all workers were employed in manufa manufacturing. Throughout their lifetimes, however, there was a 25 percentage point drop in the share of workers in manufacturing. Um, and this red line, just to get everyone on the same page, represents the first 18 years of the 1980 birth cohort's life. Um, and we can see that when the parents of this birth co cohort had their children, they really didn't expect that the job opportunities that would await these children when they entered the labor market at age 18, um, they weren't really expecting that that would be such a drastic different world than what Kenosha was in the 1970s. So if we continue viewing the experiences of ensuing cohorts, we see the same story for the 1981 cohort, the 1982 cohort, 1983, and so on, until about the 1988 birth cohort. Um, but then once we reach the 1989 birth cohort and the 1990 cohort, it's a very different story. These parents, the parents of these birth cohorts had their children after the Chrysler auto plant had closed, um, when only about a fourth of workers were employed in manufacturing. Um, and there was only about a 10 percentage point decrease in manufacturing over the, the uh, adolescent lifespan of these birth cohorts. So to start building my model, I'm gonna estimate upward mobility uh, with the first parameter, which is setting uh, manufacturing employment at age 18 uh, in 1990 for the Kenosha County, for Kenosha County. Um, and then I'll add a second parameter of historical change um, that's likewise specific to the community and specific to the cohort as well. Uh, I additionally add a set of co covariates, uh, commuting zone fixed effects, birth cohort fixed effects. Um, and in the paper, I additionally estimate a model where I 
uh, remove the commuting zone fixed effects and the birth cohort fixed effects, and I just put in county level fixed effects, and that helps me estimate deviations uh, within counties based on uh, birth cohorts as well. But today I'm just going to be presenting uh, these models. And we have, we, we're a little bit late here, so I also my urging you to talk more about your earlier slides. So um, what do you want to do here? So I'm about to get to the results really quickly. Um, and, and that will, oh, are there questions? Should I be answering? No, no, I think we should probably just, uh, it's just that we, we had originally scheduled you to stop at about a minute, uh, to, be, to, to start Jordan at about a minute, I mean. Um, so I can, I can speed up in, I probably could finish this in four minutes, probably. Okay, okay, we'll just do that. Okay. And then please audience be patient. We'll go over a little bit to, to we'll go to at least to 110. Yeah, so um, I think importantly here, uh, you know, the buildup in the methodology here is really what I want to present as well. So I think that's what's important. Um, but we, so on these two dimensions of these two parameters that I have, um, if we're just looking within Wisconsin at different counties, we can really see how both of these uh, parameters vary um, at the high end and the low end. So a place like Dane County, uh, which uh, is where University of Wisconsin-Madison is, um, we can see that they didn't really have much manufacturing to start with, and there was only uh, a really uh, small level of decrease. Um, but a place like Sheboygan uh, had a lot and uh, still did lose a fair amount. But So I'm going to present results uh, for the two outcomes of upward mobility, first uh, for mobility at age 24 and then age 26. Um, so the first parameter, which measures the share of manufacturing jobs in a county uh, at age 18 for each uh, birth cohort, uh, we see a positive coefficient here, which suggests that uh, places with more manufacturing employment also had higher levels of upward income mobility. And if we put that into a, uh, an example of actual counties, what we can see is that if we compare uh, the 1980 birth cohort in Sheboygan to the 1980 birth cohort in Dane County, um, Sheboygan had 40% of workers in manufacturing while Dane County had about 10% of workers in manufacturing. And this accounts for a difference of three income percentiles in upward mobility. So those in Dane County, uh, just based on the amount of manufacturing jobs they were, there were, this would predict uh, three income percentiles less in later life upward movement in upward mobility. If we look across the entire country between the place with the most amount of manufacturing and the place with the least amount of manufacturing, that's uh, the equivalent of about five income percentiles in difference. And then if, uh, so next, uh, Estimating the delta parameter, um, I find that a, a one percentage point decrease in manufacturing employment uh, is associated with a, uh, a decrease in uh, manufacturing by about 0.05 income percentiles. And on average, the average county in the United States lost about 10.5 percentage points in manufacturing employment. Uh, in this essentially translates into a overall decrease of 0.5 income percentiles. So most counties experience downward mobility over this nine period, nine year period um, because of manufacturing loss. And for places that lost even more manufacturing, uh, this would uh, say 30 percentage points of manufacturing this would account for a decrease of 1.5 income percentiles. So to sum everything up, uh, more manufacturing employment at labor market entry is associated with increased upward mobility. Uh, and second, larger long-term losses in manufacturing are associated with reduced upward mobility. Uh, in results that I don't present, I find that uh, these results are actually worse for black male workers than for white male workers. Um, and the results are also concentrated uh, among men and not women. And broader implications of this is that this is just an ongoing process. Um, the results I presented are only for 
nine birth cohorts um, born between 1980 to 1988. Uh, and in some additional exercises I do, I find that there's some evidence that we can uh, extend this effect out beyond those nine years. So thanks so much. Thank you. Everybody can unmute and I think can at least hear your, your electronic applause. Thank you. That was great, Nathan. Um, we have a whole bunch of questions, so we're going to pick up on an old tradition we have, which is questions without answers. So you're going to get the transcript, and you should feel free to, to recirculate it. Uh, but we're just going to transition right to uh, Jordan, if we can. So I'm not able to share my screen. OK, well, you're figuring that out. I will introduce you. Yeah. while you and Maria figure that out. So Jordan uh, just finished at uh, Penn, where he got his PhD in demography and sociology. Um, he also did an MA in statistics. Uh, Jordan, um, his dissertation was on historical trends in dementia and risk factors to forecast uh, future dementia. Um, and uh, I've already had a fair amount of interaction with Jordan, even though uh, his official mentor is Will. Uh, and, and Jordan is uh, very interested in methodology and also uh, has some interest in genetics and, uh, and potentially in, in biodemography. So uh, welcome, Jordan. Uh, how are we doing with the screen sharing? Can, I, can anyone see this? It's working at just as I finished my introduction. So take it away. We'll, we'll, we'll have you go till, um, we'll give you at least till five after. Um, okay. And then, uh, but if you want to finish shorter, we'll have we'll do some questions. Great. Uh, so thank you, Josh, for the introduction. Uh, so as, he, as Josh mentioned, I got my PhD at Penn, um, where I studied how events over the life course shape trajectories of health and inequalities therein. I also spent some time exploring methods in causal inference and machine learning and simulation. And I'm interested in fusing these lines of work here at Berkeley during my postdoc. So today I'll be talking about the development of a micro simulation model to forecast the burden of dementia in the United States. And before getting started, I just want to acknowledge the individuals who helped shape this work in one way or, or another. Norma Co, Michelle, and Sam, who formed my dissertation committee, and Jason Carlowish and Dylan Small, who I refer to as my unofficial committee members. And this work was funded by an NIH training grant awarded to the University of Pennsylvania, as well as NIH funding awarded to Norma Co. Now, with that out of the way, um, as we all know, the population in the United States is aging. We're moving towards a world where in 2060, an estimated 24% of the population will be over the age of 65, compared to just 15% in 2010. Population aging has widespread social and economic implications and will influence the number of adults with age-associated conditions, such as dementia. Dementia is a leading cause of death and disability in the United States that primarily affects adults aged 65 years or older. So considering that age is a key risk factor for dementia, there is growing concern about the increasing number of adults that will be living with this condition in the coming decades. But a growing number of studies have reported declines in both the incidence and prevalence rates of dementia over the past few decades in the United States. And the drivers of these trends remain unclear, but some reasonable hypotheses include positive trends at the population level in dementia risk factors. In recent decades, we've seen a rise of educational attainment and physical activity co-occurring with improved treatment of hypertension and reduced rates of smoking. However, we also know that the rates of physical activity remain low and there has been an increase in rates of obesity and diabetes. We also know that there will eventually be a leveling off effect in terms of population level increases in education and improvements in cardiovascular disease. What remains unclear is how these trends may affect changes in the risk of dementia at the population level and how this might influence the future burden of dementia. So it's reasonably clear that the risk of dementia changes in response to changes in its underlying risk factors, but do existing projections of dementia account for this? The short answer is no. Nearly all existing projections of dementia assume that the age and sex-specific prevalence of dementia will remain constant and that population aging alone will drive projected increases. But we know this assumption is doubtful based on recent secular trends. 
Changes in the incidence of or duration with dementia or both could lead to changes in the age-specific prevalence. So motivated by secular trends and its underlying risk factors, the objective of this work is to forecast the number of adults with dementia uh, from the year 2000 to 2050 while accounting for epidemiological and demographic changes in the population. Data for this work come primarily from the Health and Retirement Study, which is a nationally representative and longitudinal survey of US adults over the age of 50 who are surveyed every two years. The HRS has a number of linked studies, including the Aging, Demographics, and Memory Study, or ADAMS, which conducted detailed cognitive assessments among a subsample of HRS respondents. HRS investigators then created a classification scheme to categorize individuals with normal cognition, cognitive impairment without dementia, known as SIND, and dementia. And one of the many benefits of using the HRS data is its linkage with different administrative databases. Here we link the HRS with Medicare records to obtain respondent level information about dementia claims. We then use this information to classify respondents with claims-based or diagnosed dementia, as opposed to undiagnosed dementia, which we define as having a dementia level impairment based on the HRS cognitive battery, but not having a claims-based diagnosis code. Is that clear? Because that'll be important moving forward. Maybe you can say that one more time. Sure. So um, the HRS has these different cognitive measures, and from them you can derive an individual's cognitive status. And then we can link that information to Medicare claims data to see whether or not an individual has a diagnostic code for dementia. So it might be the case that I am an HRS respondent, I have dementia according to the cognitive battery, but I haven't gone to a physician and there's no code for me, so I have undiagnosed dementia. Could you say how dementia is defined as opposed to cognitive impairment without dementia? Sure, so I can get into the details on the cognitive testing later, but in short, um, HRS investigators, um, Ken Langa and David Weir, developed these cut points um, based on this sub-study called ADAMS, in which they sort of crosswalked the prevalence of um, sort of mild cognitive impairment and dementia from their sub-study of about 900 respondents to the entire HRS sample based on a modified version of the mini mental state examination. And so um, this is the framework of the model. So this is where I will spend most of my time. Um, so to get this simulation working, I begin by creating a representative base population for the year 2000. To do this, I use HRS provided sampling weights and population counts provided by the census for the year 2000 to upweight the baseline HRS sample so it's nationally representative in terms of size and composition of the population of adults aged 51 years and older. Then I use data from the HRS for years 2000 to 2010 to estimate covariate specific transition matrices for the state space, which I will show you briefly and then return back here. So we have a five state model where individuals can transition between states of being healthy or having SIND, undiagnosed dementia, diagnosed dementia, and death. SIND, as I mentioned, is cognitive impairment without dementia and indicates a less severe form of impairment. Undiagnosed dementia is defined as having a dementia level of impairment as determined by the HRS cognitive testing, and diagnosed dementia is defined as having a diagnosis in linked Medicare claims records. These transitions are estimated using multinomial models adjusted for age, demographics, and comorbidities, which include body mass, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and stroke. And in these models, the outcome is the state to which an individual transitions to in a given survey wave. And we adjust for the from state um, an individual transitions from. So back to the framework, um, after initializing the base population and parameterizing the transition matrices to describe movement between the state space that we just looked at, the next step is generating replenishing cohorts to account for the clusters of 51-year-olds who age into the model every year. The simulation begins in the year 2000 and is restricted to adults aged 51 years and older. So 
a 50 year old in the year 2000 will age into the model in 2001, for example. I use population counts and forecasts provided by the census to reflect the size and composition of the incoming cohorts of 51 year olds in each simulation cycle for the years 2001 to 2050. Then to account for unobserved future risk factor levels, for example, in body mass and diabetes, I estimate historical trends in the average annual growth rate of risk factors obtained from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or BRFIS, which surveys a nationally representative sample of about 500,000 adults in the US every year. I adjust and use the changes in the average annual growth rate to create factors of change or trend components which I then apply to future incoming cohorts for which we do not observe data. And this provides forecasts which reflect uncertainty for future trends and the underlying risk factors that shape transitions in the state space. And because incoming individuals enter the simulation at age 51, at which time the risk of dementia is very low, I assume that all entering individuals are cognitively healthy. So we have our base population replenishing cohorts and the transition matrices they are all subjected to. And these matrices are assumed to remain constant for the duration of the simulation for all individuals. Um, the next phase is simulation. So to determine the state to which an individual will transition or remain in each cycle, a random variable is drawn from a Bernoulli distribution for comorbidities such as diabetes or stroke and a categorical distribution for body mass and the state space. And these distributions are shaped by transition matrices obtained in the parameterization phase. All comorbidities have an absorbing state. So once you have diabetes, for example, you have it for the duration of your simulated life. I then repeat this process um, for 50 simulation cycles spanning the years 2000 to 2050 and do that 500 times to get a range of outcomes. Each time I take 5% random samples with replacement of the base population and each replenishing cohort to ease the computing process. And that was a lot. So to give you an indication of what this actually looks like and clarify some of the variables used in the model, I will show you the output for one simulated individual. So here we have, is that, is he okay. Um, here we have a 50 year old female with a college degree. The left go ahead and go ahead and use your mouse. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so here, uh, the leftmost column indicates the simulation cycle where row zero uh, indicates baseline in the year 2000 and row 25 at the bottom indicates the 25th simulation cycle in the year 2025. So this uh, woman starts off in the year 2000 with a healthy weight and a normal level of cognition but has heart disease. At age 58, uh, she develops hypertension, which she will have for the duration of the simulation. At age 71, she moves from being healthy weight to underweight, all while being free of cognitive impairment. Now, at the age of 78, she returns to a healthy weight. But as she gets older, she develops diabetes at age 79. At age 86, she develops mild cognitive impairment as indicated by the two on the far right hand side here. Um, at age 88, she is diagnosed with dementia, which she has for five years before dying at age 93 in the year 2043. Um, so now that we've seen how this works for one individual, uh, we can turn to the population as a whole. Here I'm showing the forecast obtained from the simulation together with the observed counts from the health and retirement study. On the x-axis is the year, on the y-axis is the number of adults with dementia, both diagnosed and undiagnosed, shown in millions. The black points in this figure correspond to the weighted count of adults observed in the HRS with diagnosed or undiagnosed dementia for the years 2000 to 2014. The solid gray line shows the mean forecasted population count for dementia and the dashed lines correspond to the range from 500 simulations. 
Importantly, the simulation picks up the observed measures from the HRS, including for the years 2012 and 2014, which were not used to estimate the transition matrices. And this serves as a form of internal validation to an extent um, with the HRS. So overall, the number of adults with undiagnosed or diagnosed dementia is estimated to increase from 6.3 million in 2010 to about 10.2 million in 2030 and 16.3 million in 2050, corresponding to a more than two-fold increase from 2010 to 2050. Here is a more detailed look at how these processes unfold over time. On the x-axis is the year, on the y-axis again is the total population count in millions. The green bars on the bottom correspond to healthy adults. The blue bars one step up are adults with SIND, which is a mild form of dementia. Cases of undiagnosed dementia are in red and diagnosed dementia cases are in orange. So once you add the number of adults with SIND to the counts for dementia, the forecasted number of adults with any impairment increases from 11.2 million in 2010 to about 27.5 million in 2050. And what's important to note about SIND is that individuals may recover from a mild state of impairment, but they also face higher risk of dementia. About 22% of adults with mild impairment transition to dementia over a period of three years, which should be captured in this model. Um, so although there is a chance of a recovery, these cases of SIND are likely to progress to dementia within a few years time which is important to note given that severity of impairment and transitions between states of impairment have mostly been left out of prior um, projections and forecasts. We can also look at the counts of adults with dementia by gender and race and Hispanic origin. Again, we have year on the x-axis and the number of adults with dementia on the y-axis. All subgroups exhibit some degree of increase between 2000 and 2050. The estimates obtained from the model suggest Hispanic men and women will experience the largest and fastest increases in dementia, likely due to these subgroups being the fastest growing demographic in the US and the fact that Hispanic adults face two to three times a higher risk of dementia compared to non-Hispanic white adults. And we see for non-Hispanic black men and women, they show a relatively steady trajectory uh, before increasing in conjunction with the other subgroups. And finally, the results from this simulation can be compared with existing projections. Um, when I told my dissertation committee I wanted to develop a forecasting model for dementia, and then my next slide was what we already know uh, or expect for the year 2050, they were kind of concerned that there was no innovation, um, but I will hopefully convince you there is a little bit at least. So the estimates obtained from this work, again, are shown in gray and are the largest, but it's important to note key differences from prior work. Colored lines with a circle indicate projections that focused exclusively on Alzheimer's dementia, which represents a fractional majority of dementia cases, and we'd expect that to undercount the overall burden. The colored lines with triangles indicate studies that projected all-cause dementia, um, and these studies are limited in that they assume constant prevalence or they use either survey-based measures of impairment or claims-based measures of impairment, not both. And this is problematic for many reasons. One being that they are likely to undercount the number of adults with dementia, especially those with cognitive impairment, which is not yet recognized by their healthcare system, which itself may be a reflection of their access to healthcare or how they utilize services. And there is an increasing number of studies now showing um, disparities in who is and who is not diagnosed with dementia. So the few projections that do rely on Medicare data are going to undercount the burden among underrepresented um, minorities, which is also concern concerning given that they're making up an increasing share of older adults in the US. So next steps. Um, the inputs to this model in terms of the dementia risk factors are derived from estimating average annual growth rates uh, from the BRFIS. So it'll be important to look at how sensitive the output is to those results. Um, this framework allows for testing hypothetical interventions to see what would happen if we were to reduce diabetes or you know, answer a question such as to what extent would we have to decrease the risk of diabetes to offset some of this burden. 
and then some in-progress work is estimating the costs. Dementia is very, very expensive, um, and a lot of that cost is driven by informal care. So also looking at how many caregivers we will need in light of this increasing burden of dementia and changes in family structure. Um, the steps after that include estimating dynamic transition probabilities. Uh, the current framework sort of relies on static transition rates, um, but it could be interesting to see what would happen if we allow those to vary over time. It'll also be interesting to allow for code add-ons um, so we can examine these types of interventions that properly account for time varying confounding and or mediation. For example, if we boost the level of education in the US that will have implications for these health risk factors and family formation and the availability of caregivers. And along with that um, is developing a web-based app perhaps in the future. So people, but mostly us can explore how different inputs and policies may affect forecasts. And then the steps after that would be taking this, you know, globally and um, developing this framework for other countries using the gateway to global aging data. Most of the aging population will be outside of the US and in low and middle income countries in the coming decades, where relatively little is known about dementia or its burden, the availability of care. So setting this up so it can then be, you know, applied in these other contexts will be important moving forward. And that's all I have for now. Great, thank you, Jordan. And thank you for being uh, so uh, efficient. Uh, we're already, we're, we're perfectly on time because you, you went quickly and uh, you also gave us a lot to chew on. Uh, why don't we start with a couple of uh, questions. I'm gonna try something new. I'm gonna call on people if they don't mind unmuting. So I see I have questions from Ken and Ron. So why don't we start with a question from Ken? Do you mind unmuting and asking a question, Ken? So I wondered about uh, uh, merging into this uh, prevalence of the APOE4 allele. There is genetic data in the HRS and there's now considerable genetic data in associated sources and this is such a strong uh, predictor of transition to Alzheimer's that it would seem uh, an important, uh, important variable to add into long-term projections. Yeah, so I, that is something I was hoping to account for. Um, so HRS provides publicly available polygenic scores for dementia. Um, they also provide APOE genotypes, but it's my understanding those are only available for non-Hispanic white adults. And so I wouldn't have sort of a distribution of the E4 allele um, unless I looked for external resources or sources which are available. The key issue there in my mind was sort of forecasting the future distribution of APOE4 in the population. That's something I gave a lot of thought to, but wasn't quite sure how to implement. So if you have ideas, I would be very, very interested. Great, and then uh, Ron, you asked a few questions. Do you want to pick one to ask? Uh, uh, yeah, so um, Jordan, in your uh, figure four, where you show your forecasts with an uncertainty band, I'm just trying to understand, well, there it is also in figure seven. Um, I'm trying to understand what kinds of uncertainty are reflected in that uh, uncertainty band. And in particular, I'm, I'm guessing it's just, uh, I don't know, what might be called sampling uncertainty. Um, that is the different simulations come out differently, randomly, but probably not uncertainty in the underlying estimated transition probabilities or, and I'm not sure about this, but I, you're estimating trends in them as well, I think, or uncertainty in those trend terms for the transition probabilities if, if those are part of it or other things of that sort. Uh, well, if what I say is right, that that just means you're, the kind of uncertainty you're including are what is generally done in forecasts, but understates the actual. Yeah, so there are 
a few sources of uncertainty. Uh, the key one that you mentioned is sampling uncertainty. Another one, um, there's uncertainty in terms of the trends. So I estimated the average annual growth rate of these different um, comorbidities, which shape the transition matrices. And I applied sort of constants to those rates to allow them to increase or decrease over time. And this was all sort of randomized um, in a way that, you know, you might pick up a group of people who have high risk, but in that scenario, the trends are declining. Um, so there are a, several sources of uncertainty and I tried to do it in a way that sort of was data driven and didn't have me picking the high risk people and subjecting them to different types of um, trends. It's just sort of random draws. And in terms of the comparison to the future elderly model, I would say that they have a very robust model. It's um, something developed by Dana Goldman and his collaborators at USC. And it's perhaps one of the most well-known simulation models for older adults in the US. And it covers a number of comorbidities, but my sort of perspective has been what they cover in sort of breadth, I cover in depth in terms of looking at transitions between states of impairment and bringing in the Medicare data to see what happens when you account for undiagnosed dementia versus diagnosed dementia. Thank you, Jordan. Okay, maybe we have a minute that we can uh, we can aim some questions at Nathan. Uh, maybe I'll kick things off with kind of big philosophical question. Uh, I think that uh, geographic mobility has gone down quite a bit the last couple of decades. Uh, what's the story? If people are not finding opportunity where they are and if mobility, intergenerational mobility is declining, why aren't people taking, why aren't people responding to that and, and moving? Why does place matter more today than it may have 20 or 30 or 50 years ago, which just seems like the wrong direction for modernity. We should be able to be free of place. Is that too big a philosophical question? Does it relate at all to what you talked about? That, that definitely relates. Um, so uh, I should note that the measure of intergenerational mobility, it also includes uh, whether or not the birth cohorts moved from the county that they were, uh, where they were when it was a measure during the, the parent uh, time period, age 15 to 19, um, whether or not they stayed in that county or left, uh, it's still, they're still in that, um, they're still in that measurement. Um, but yeah, as you said, uh, there's been declining uh, geographic mobility, whether that's um, across counties within states or across states. Um, and a lot of that's based off of, or I guess it's theorized that the reason for that is that there's just aren't enough uh, economic opportunities to move for. There's no reason to move across the state because uh, there's there's just less likely to be uh, an economic economic incentive to do that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the issues with uh, the study um, that it's it's hard to really get a grasp of uh, people moving elsewhere and what those new conditions are elsewhere. But at least. Um, I can identify that they were at least in, uh, you know, their county of Ord, you know, where they were raised um, at that point. You're muted, Josh. Is, is place really mattering more uh, than it used to? Uh, should we expect place to become immaterial uh, in the decades ahead? Now we're all working from home. Uh, maybe too big a question. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think one thing to consider is um, there definitely was a, a movement in the geography of where ma manufacturing jobs were and a lot that had to do with, um, with uh, labor union laws, that sort of stuff. Um, and that really moved uh, ma manufacturing jobs at least um, to different regions. Um, from the Midwest to the South, um, for instance. Josh, if you're talking, you're muted. 
thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I th we're basically right on time to finish our session. So I'm going to end the official session. Uh, next week, um, we're going to probably try something new for, for, for the post uh, brown bag. Um, Dennis has, has found something, a, a way for us to socialize afterwards and like meeting up also in geographic space of the computer, we kind of point our mouse someplace and we go and talk to Claude or to Aisha or whoever might be there. So we'll try that uh, next week. Uh, it was just great to hear uh, so much, uh, so many exciting projects from uh, our two uh, new postdocs. And if anybody has uh, uh, anything that's going on that you can invite them to, please do. And I'll try to do the same to you. And we will uh, we will connect uh, and make our connection stronger somehow, uh, even when we're are, are separated. So thanks everybody, and uh, we will see you next week. And let's uh, turn off our mute and give some real uh, applause to uh, both of our speakers. Thank you for wonderful talks. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye.